Look, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Amen. God's word that we meditate on this morning is our Old Testament lesson from Numbers chapter 21. They traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no bread, there's no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people, and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it on a pole. And when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. This is the word of the Lord. They were on the move, finally heading to their final destination. They knew exactly where they were going. It's the journey that their parents had started over 40 years ago, and it was about ready to come to an end. But maybe they get a little too excited a little too early. What they maybe thought was going to be this smooth road right to the promised land was filled with some bumps and detours. You see, the direct route into their entry point into that promised land of Canaan was on the east side of Canaan, uh, east of the Dead Sea. But, but to get there, you had to travel through Edom. But the king of Edom wouldn't let them. Instead, they needed to do a hundred-mile detour around Edom to get to that point. And if the hundred miles on foot through the desert wasn't enough, they lost their spiritual leader and high priest Aaron to death. They have to fight the nation of Arid, who kidnaps some of their people along the way. And again, all the while, through the hot desert with small children, pregnant women, and all of their belongings. A few bumps and detours along the way to that promised land. But before you start to feel too sorry for these Israelites, let's recall why they're here in the first place. <laughs> Let's remember why they're not back in slavery in Egypt still. Let, let's remember why they're wandering in the desert here, why they're not in that promised land already, and, and why are they not all dead for that matter? <laughs> well, they, 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 they're not in slavery anymore in Egypt because God miraculously rescued them. He rescued their parents over 40 years ago through under Moses. And told them that he was going to take them from slavery to freedom to that promised land, to that land flowing with milk and honey, that, that land of Canaan, that they're on their way to enter now. And why aren't they there yet? Well, because their parents had been basically in the same spot, but they, they didn't believe that God would help them get in there. They, they, they thought that the people there couldn't be defeated, and so God said, all right, wander you will for 40 years in the desert. But yet here they are, the second generation of Israelites who, who should be in that land flowing with milk and honey if their parents would have just trusted and obeyed God. But yet here they are, doing okay, <laughs> in the middle of the desert. They, they've, they've manna and quail provided by God miraculously. Nehemiah records that their clothes never wore out, their feet never blistered. A faithful, loving, compassionate father providing for every need for every day for these people. And yet, what do they do? 
Maybe the heat's getting to him. <laughs> but also a lack of trust. They begin to grumble. They begin to complain again. Right? If, they, if they learned one thing from their forefathers, from their parents, it was how to take God's blessings for granted. <laughs> Seeing how he miraculously is providing for them every single day, and yet so quick to complain. They start to complain to Moses here in our lesson. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no bread, there's no water, and we detest this miserable food, this manna and quail, every single day, day after day after day. Instead of praying, they pout. They take their eyes off of all that God has already done for them, how he is miraculously sustaining them every single day, and and that promised land that is is very soon to come. They begin to question God, to question his love for them. Is he there for them? Take their eyes off his faithfulness to them. They grow impatient and fall into that lie of Satan. Satan. That God is not really faithful. God is not really good. God doesn't really love you. You know, that's when God steps in. And he says, enough. Enough of this grumbling. Enough of this complaining. I will remind you just how much I do love you. I will remind you again just how gracious I really am to you. God would keep the promise to bring this generation into the promised land, but, but they need a little perspective here. They need a little reminder of who is leading them and how much he loves them and and how much they really need him. God uses venomous snakes, indigenous to this Arabian desert here, to be his agent of perspective for these Israelites. He allows them to come into their camp and to bite. And many died. And the people realize what they've done. That, that these snakes are attacking. They, they realize this is, this is God disciplining us, chastising us for our disobedience, for our grumbling and complaining, for our unfaithfulness to him. Right? And, and he sends these snakes to give them this perspective. To realize that they need him. And they're led to finally look outside of themselves and realize what they've been doing. And they've gotten what they deserve. And to look to God. To help them in their need. They go to Moses. And they say, we've sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take these snakes away from us. It's easy for us to to read this account of the Israelites and and take into account all of the other Bible history that we have on this generation and the generation before of Israelites and begin to look back and say, what a bunch of disobedient, ungrateful, spoiled sinners. I mean, come on. They they just continue to, to defile and defy God's word over and over. They, they just continue to disobey him and complain and grumble. But yet God continues to love them and be faithful to them. They don't deserve this promised land. I mean, God, as, as just as he is, why wouldn't he just destroy these people and pick another people who would be faithful, more faithful to him? Why is God so faithful to such unfaithful people. It's a great question to ask. <laughs> Why is God so faithful to such unfaithful people? It's a good question for us to ask ourselves. Have we defied our God over and over? Have we been unfaithful to him 
when we see his continued love to us in every day of our lives? Have we grumbled and complained, even though God provides everything we need for this life? We know that promised land of heaven that's waiting for us at the end, but, but yet we continue to question God's love for us. We continue to wonder if he's really good and if he's going to be faithful to us. Right? It's so easy for us to, to realize how unfaithful we have been to our faithful God. Why would God be so faithful to unfaithful people like us? Friends, God chose us to be his people. <laughs> he has freed us from the slavery, not of, of in Egypt, but slavery to sin, and death, and the devil. We've been set free from that. And, and, and all along the way, he, he promises to provide every single one of our needs. But what do we do? We complain and grumble about what we don't have and what we lack. God promises us in his means of grace, through the word and the sacrament, he wants to give us every spiritual blessing that we could ever want or imagine. But what do we do? We find the things of this life more important, more worthy of our time. We elevate the things of this life over the means of grace. We know we're on our way to that promised land of heaven, but what do we do? We're quick to grumble and complain about the circumstances of our lives. Right? We grumble that we've got to scrape by every day. We complain that someone else got the raise that I deserved. We question God when he allows the health of my loved one to continue to seemingly deteriorate. We wonder, why would God allow this struggle to happen in my marriage or with my parent or with my child? We grumble and complain. We question God's faithfulness and his goodness and his love to us. We get so wrapped up in the momentary troubles and discomforts of this life. We take our eyes off of God and Look at all of our troubles and worries and discomforts and cry, right, why? Along with these Israelites, why would you bring us out into this desert to die? That solution that God gives to his people in the Old Testament seems so simple, doesn't it? So simple that it, it almost can't be real, right? He tells Moses, after Moses prays for the people, <coughs> he says, make a snake, put it on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. And so Moses made a bronze snake, and he put it on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at that bronze snake, they lived. It's so simple. There's nothing they had to do. They, they didn't have to prove that they were going to be more faithful to God. They didn't have to do any sort of good works to get back in God's good graces. They cried out in their helplessness. They confessed their sinfulness. They acknowledged their need for their God. And simply by looking at a bronze snake on a pole, God didn't take the snakes away. He gave them something better. He gave them the promise of healing. He gave the, them the promise of life. E even someone who maybe was in the last moments, right, gasping their final breaths of air as that venom was going through their body, they looked at that bronze snake in complete and total healing. The way that God saved his people in that desert. The way that he poured out his grace and his mercy on them once again. Faithful to his promise that 
he loved them and would provide for them and would get them to that promised land. They just look and live. They looked outside of themselves and they looked to that snake on that pole and they found life. Dear friends, sometimes that agent of perspective is necessary in our life too, isn't it? Right? When, when these feelings and these attitudes that, that we have as we take our eyes off of God and we begin to look at the troubles and the struggles of our life and these fill our hearts and mind, God sends these agents of, of perspective. And it might not be poisonous snakes, right? but he may send things in our life to make us look to him. Right? Th those situations in life when that, that seem bad, they, they might even become more seemingly hopeless. Right? A, a situation where we feel like we're scraping by, but, but then it turns to losing, a, losing and having to foreclose on our house. Or maybe that raise we thought we should got, we, it ends up with a pink slip. Or when we complain to God about the health of our loved one, it ends in an unexpected death. Or when that strained relationship causes us to question God, that relationship may become broken completely. And, and I'm not saying that there is direct consequences for every sin in this life, but, but God uses these circumstances in our life to, to make us take our attention off of ourselves and on Him. In His love, He disciplines us to look outside of ourselves and to look to Him alone. And to provide for us not freedom from the snakes of this life that come into our lives and bring us trouble and discomfort, that bring evil and suffering into our lives, but instead to provide us with something better, that we are able to look, not to a bronze snake on a pole, but to look to a cross, To look to that cross and to find life. To look outside of ourselves. To acknowledge our hopelessness and our helplessness on our own. To confess our sinfulness. To look then outside of ourselves and then to hear that gracious invitation to look to that cross and to find life. There at that cross to find all of our impatience and all of our unfaithfulness, and all of our grumbling, and all of our complaining, nailed there. Forgiven. To look to that cross and to find life in that death of God's one and only Son for us. To look up to that cross and to see one who doesn't deserve death, but who for you and me lived that perfect life of faithfulness to God and then suffers the punishment that we deserved so that we could have the promise of forgiveness and peace and life through him. Jesus connects the dots for us. We heard it in our gospel lesson from John chapter 3. That we heard through the inspired writer that just as Moses lifted up that snake in the desert on that pole. So the Son of Man must be lifted up that all who believe in him and look to him have the promise of eternal life. This account in Numbers is a foreshadowing of what Christ would come to do for us. There at the cross we see the fulfillment of this account in the Arabian desert. That we get to look to that cross of Jesus and there find the promise of new life right now. Even in the midst of our troubles and our discomforts and our, and our sufferings, we find the promise of new life and peace in Christ. And we have the promise that through that, we have that promised land of heaven that's waiting for us. We have the promise that we will get to be with him forever. Friends, it's these days of Lent. 
And it's good for us to, to look inside. To look inside and to acknowledge our helplessness on our own. To acknowledge our need for something outside of ourselves to save us. To confess our sinfulness and our unfaithfulness and our impatience and our grumbling and our complaining before our faithful God, but also then to look up. To heed that gracious invitation to look up to that cross of Christ and to find there the promise of life. And then to direct our eyes from that cross to that empty tomb to find our joy and our peace and our purpose to live new and resurrected lives brought from death to life in Christ that in Christ now we get to go on our journey to that promised land with our God providing every step of the way remembering all that he has done for us in the past remembering how he is miraculously providing everything we need right now for our bodies and souls and to know the promises that are still to be fulfilled that he will bring us into that promised land of heaven. That we get to, in Christ, be set free from slavery and in this desert of this life to do good works, to show our love and thanks and praise for all that this Savior, crucified and risen, has done for us. Dear friends, look to that cross. Believe in what Christ has done for you there and go and live. Amen. Please stand.